Welcome to lesson two of our matter and energy unit. Here we're gonna talk about energy. In our first lesson, we talked about matter. The other major thing that chemists are going to be interested in is the energy that's in substances and the way that different substances interact with energy over the course of the phenomena that we want to investigate. Let's take a moment and make sure that we're all on the same page with regard to a definition of energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work. The obvious question there is, well, what's work? Work is defined as the ability to exert a force over a distance. So if you can exert a force over a distance, you are doing work. Another question you might have is, that's great, but what's a force? A force is defined as a push away from something or a pull towards something. So if you can push or pull something away from or towards you, you are using energy to do that. And that's really what we're interested in. Though a lot of times, of course, it's not going to be the big macro kinds of things that you think about when you think about pushing and pulling. Here in chemistry, a lot of times it's going to be at the atomic scale. Energy comes in two major flavors, kinetic energy and potential energy. Kinetic energy, or Ke, is defined as the energy of motion. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. Here are a couple of examples. A car hitting a wall is a great example of what we call mechanical energy, which is when large things are moving through space. Electrical energy comes from the movement of electrons, either through wires or in the case of this lightning strike. And a big one for us is going to be thermal energy, which comes from the movement of molecules. In order to measure and understand thermal energy, we're often going to be most interested in something's temperature. Temperature is defined as the average kinetic energy of a substance. If a substance's particles have a higher average kinetic energy, then that substance will have a higher temperature. It really is that simple. There are a bunch of temperature scales. Here in chemistry, we're really only gonna use two of them. We're gonna use the Celsius scale, which is based on water. In normal conditions on Earth, zero degrees Celsius is the temperature at which water freezes, and 100 degrees Celsius is the temperature at which it boils. We're also gonna often use the Kelvin scale, which is based on absolute zero and is very closely related to the Celsius scale. One scale that we're never going to use ever is the Fahrenheit scale, which to be honest, really isn't based on stupidity. It's actually based on something pretty logical for the time. I would encourage you to go research it and figure out what Fahrenheit used as his zero and 100 points on that scale, but it's not very practical and it's really not standardized. And so as a result, we're never going to use it in this class. We're gonna stick strictly with Celsius and Kelvin. Now, as I just discussed, Celsius and Kelvin are very closely related and you're going to need to be able to convert between them. The relationship between them is as follows. Zero degrees Celsius is defined as 273 degrees Kelvin. That formula is given to you on reference table T. You can see it right here. In order to go from Celsius to Kelvin, you're just going to add 273 to your answer. In order to go from Kelvin to Celsius, you're going to subtract 273. That's really it. Pretty easy. One thing that you should take a moment and understand is that the magnitude of degrees in both the Celsius and Kelvin scales are the same size. So as a result, the difference between 273 degrees Kelvin and 274 degrees Kelvin is the same as the difference between zero degrees Celsius and one degree Celsius. A change by X degrees Kelvin is going to equal a change by X degrees Celsius. One question that you might have is, well, why do we need this Kelvin scale? Kelvin, by the way, named after William Thompson, who later in life became Lord Kelvin. The reason is really that we're gonna deal with a lot of temperatures that happen below zero degrees Celsius. And mathematically, when we start to put in negative values, when we start to put in zeros, we start to get into problems. So Kelvin really gives us a way to analyze things that are happening at temperatures below zero degrees Celsius mathematically without having to worry about the problems that we see with negatives and zeros. Coincidentally, we're never going to have to deal with a temperature below zero degrees Kelvin as it's defined as the lowest temperature that we'll ever have in the universe, the so-called absolute zero. So if you're ever dealing with a problem in Kelvin and you're dealing with a negative or a zero, something has gone wrong somewhere. And please take a moment and make sure that you address that before you actually wind up getting the wrong answer out of your problem. The other kind of energy is, of course, potential energy, or PE. Potential energy is defined as the energy of position. I like to think about it as stored energy. It always has to do with the arrangement of matter. Matter can be arranged in ways that put more energy into that arrangement. As a result, the potential energy of that arrangement will be higher. Here are a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. 
A coiled spring is a really good example because by arranging that spring in a tight coil, we've now put energy into it that can be released when that spring is allowed to uncoil. Dynamite's a good example of what we call chemical energy, which is a very common type of energy that we'll see in chemistry. That has to do with the arrangement of the atoms, particularly the electrons in the bonds that they formed between each other. We'll talk a whole lot more about that over the course of this year. And of course, stuff up high always has more potential energy than stuff down below. We can always see that by taking something up high and dropping it and seeing that energy be released. Though hopefully, of course, we'll never drop the International Space Station onto the surface of the planet. As chemists, we're going to want to be able to measure energy. And there are a few ways to do this. Generally speaking, in order to measure potential energy, we're always going to convert it into kinetic energy first and measure that kinetic energy to know how much potential energy was stored in that substance. This is a process known as calorimetry, and we're going to do that in this class. We'll actually talk about it in the last lesson of this unit. A calorimeter is a device that's calibrated in such a way that it enables us to allow a substance to go through a change and measure the change in energy that happens as a result. Here are these two different types of calorimeters, just shown more diagrammatically with all the different parts labeled. We'll talk more about them again at the end of this unit. When we deal with energy, we're really going to be focused on the unit called the joule, named after James Prescott Joule, which is the standard unit for energy. You really don't need to worry about how it's derived, but it is a complex unit to go back to our conversion into discussion. It comes from the combination of a bunch of other units put together. Generally speaking, here in chemistry, we're going to deal with processes that absorb or release energy on the kilojoule scale, which is 10 to the third of the base unit. Before we end, I just want to talk a little bit more in depth about heat. The first thing I'd encourage you to do is make sure that you don't confuse heat and temperature. Here's an example to help you get your head around the difference between the two. A glass of hot tea has a higher temperature than the Arctic Ocean, but the Arctic Ocean has much, much more heat energy in it. My question to you is why? Take a moment and write down your answer. See if you can tell the difference between heat and temperature and why this statement is a true statement. The other thing that you should be aware of is that heat will always go from where it's hot to where it's not. To use our tea and Arctic Ocean example from the previous slide, if we were to put them into contact with each other, heat would go from the hot tea to the Arctic Ocean. If we wanted to represent this as a particle diagram, we can kind of see what's going on here. The hotter substance has a higher average kinetic energy. And so when we put it in contact with the colder substance, energy is going to be transferred from that higher average kinetic energy to the lower average kinetic energy until everything is at the same average kinetic energy or what we might call thermal equilibrium. As humans, it's really easy to think about cold as something separate from heat. But as chemists, it's important to understand that cold is really just the absence of heat. The reason that we sense things as hotter or colder as human organisms has to do with our nervous system and how our nervous system interprets the average kinetic energy of the things that it comes into contact with. From an energetic standpoint, the things that we feel as colder just exist at lower average kinetic energies than the things that we feel as hotter. Let's take a moment here at the end of this video and make sure that you can do each of the following things. Can you explain the relationship between matter and energy? Can you classify different types of energy as either kinetic or potential in nature? Can you explain the relationship between the kinetic energy of a substance and that substance's temperature? Can you convert between Celsius and Kelvin? And finally, can you predict the direction that heat will flow when we have substances at different temperatures brought into contact with each other? If you can do each of those things, fantastic. If not, take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always get in touch with me by leaving a comment below the video or through the contact information in the info field. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Take it easy.